Chapter 2 Strangers When Rand and Matt carried the first barrels through the common room, Master Alvier was already filling a pair of mugs with his best brown ale, his own make, from one of the casks racked against one wall. Scratch, the inn's yellow cat, crouched atop it with his eyes closed and his tail wrapped around his feet. Tam stood in front of the big fireplace of River Rock, thumbing a long-stemmed pipe full of tabac from a polished canister the innkeeper always kept in the plain stone mantle. The fireplace stretched half the length of the big square room, with a lintel as high as a man's shoulder, and the crackling blaze of the hearth vanquished the chill outside. At that time of the busy day before festival, Rand expected to find the common room empty except for Bran and his father and the cat. But four more members of the village council, including Sen, sat in high-backed chairs in front of the fire, mugs in hand and blue-gray pipe smoke wreathing their heads. For once, none of the stones boards were in use, and all of Bran's books stood idle on the shelf opposite the fireplace. The men did not even talk, peering silently into their ale, or tapping pipe stems against their teeth in impatience as they waited for Tam and Bran to join them. Worry was not uncommon for the village council these days, not on Emmons Field, and likely not in Watch Hill or Devon Ride, or even Tarn Ferry, though who knew what Tarn Ferry folk really thought about anything. Only two of the men before the fire, Ara Luhan, the blacksmith, and John Thane, the miller, so much as glanced at the boys as they entered. Master Luhan, though, made it more than a glance. The blacksmith's arms were as big as most men's legs, roped with heavy muscle. And he still wore his long leather apron, as if he had hurried to the meeting straight from the forge. His frown took them both in, then he straightened around in his chair deliberately, turning his attention back to an overstudious tamping of his pipe with a thick thumb. Curious, Rand slowed, then barely bit back a yelp as Matt kicked his ankle. His friend nodded insistently toward the doorway at the back of the common room and hurried down without waiting. Limping slightly, Rand followed less quickly. What was that about? he demanded as soon as he was in the hall that led to the kitchen. You almost broke my... It's old Luhan, Matt said, peering past Rand's shoulder into the common room. I think he suspects I was the one who... He cut off abruptly as Mistress Alvier bustled out of the kitchen, the aroma of fresh-baked bread wafting ahead of her. The tray in her hands carried some of the crusty loaves for which she was famous around Emmons Field, as well as plates of pickles and cheese. The food reminded Rand abruptly that he had eaten only an end of bread before leaving the farm that morning. His stomach gave an embarrassing rumble. A slender woman with a thick braid of graying hair pulled over one shoulder. Mistress Alvier smiled in a motherly fashion that took in both of them. There is more of this in the kitchen if you two are hungry, and I never knew boys your age who weren't. Or any other age, for that matter. If you prefer, I'm baking honey cakes this morning. She was one of the few married women in the area who never tried to play matchmaker with Tam. Toward Rand, her motherliness extended to warm smiles and a quick snack whenever he came by the inn. But she did as much for every young man in the area. If she occasionally looked at him as if she wanted to do more, at least she took it no further than looks, for which he was deeply grateful. Without waiting for a reply, she swept on into the common room. Immediately, there was the sound of chairs scraping on the floor as the men got to their feet, and exclaimings over the smell of the bread. She was easily the best cook in Hemmons Field, and not a man for miles around, but eagerly leaped at a chance to put his feet under her table. Honey cakes, Matt said, smacking his lips. After, Rand told him firmly, but we'll never get done. A lamp hung over the cellar stairs, just beside the kitchen door, and another made a bright pool in the stone-walled room beneath the inn, banishing all but a little dimness in the furthest corners. Wooden racks along the walls and across the floor held casks of brandy and cider, and larger barrels of ale and wine, some with taps driven in. Many of the wine barrels were marked with chalk in Branalvir's hand, giving the year they had been bought, what peddler had brought them, and in which city they had been made. But all of the ale and brandy was the make of Two Rivers farmers or of Bran himself. Peddlers and even merchants sometimes brought brandy or ale from outside, but it was never as good and cost the earth besides, and nobody ever drank it more than once. Now, Rand said, as they set their casks in the racks, what did you do that you have to avoid Master Luhan? Matt shrugged. 
Nothing, really. I told Dan Alcar and some of his snot-nosed friends, Ewan Fingar and Dag Coplin, that some farmers had seen ghost hounds breathing fire and running through the woods. They ate it up like clotted cream. And Master Luhan is mad at you for that? Rand said doubtfully. Not exactly. Matt paused, then shook his head. You see, I covered two of his dogs with flour, so they were all white. Then I let them loose near Dag's house. How was I to know they'd run straight home? It really isn't my fault. If Mistress Luhan hadn't left the door open, they couldn't have gotten inside. It isn't like I intended to get flour all over her house. He gave a bark of laughter. I hear she chased old Luhan and the dogs, all three, out of the house with a broom. Rand winced and laughed at the same time. If I were you, I'd worry more about Alsbet Luhan than about the blacksmith. She's almost as strong and her temper is a lot worse. No matter, though. If you walk fast, maybe he won't notice you. Matt's expression said he did not think Rand was funny. When they went back through the common room, though, there was no need for Matt to hurry. The six men had their chairs in a tight knot before the fireplace. With his back to the fire, Tam was speaking in a low voice, and the others were leaning forward to listen. So intent on his words, they would likely not have noticed if a flock of sheep had been driven through. Rand wanted to move closer to hear what they were talking about, but Matt plucked at his sleeve and gave him an agonized look. With a sigh, he followed Matt out to the cart. On their return to the hallway, they found a tray by the top of the steps and hot honey cakes filling the hall with their sweet aroma. There were two mugs as well and a pitcher of steaming mulled cider. Despite his own admonition about waiting until later, Rand found himself making the last two trips between cart and cellar while trying to juggle a cask and a piping honey cake. Setting his final cask in the racks, he wiped crumbs from his mouth while Matt was unburdening himself, then said, Now for the glee... Feet clattered on the stairs, and Ellen Fingar half fell into the cellar in his haste, his pudgy face shining with eagerness to impart his news. There are strangers in the village! He caught his breath and gave Matt a wry look. I haven't seen any ghost hounds, but I hear somebody flowered Master Luhan's dogs. I hear Mistress Luhan has ideas who to look for, too. The years separating Rand and Matt from Ellen, only fourteen, were usually more than enough for them to give short shrift to anything he had to say. This time they exchanged one startled glance, then both were talking at once. In the village? Rand asked. Not in the woods? Right on top of him, Matt added. Was his cloak black? Could you see his face? Ellen looked uncertainly from one of them to the other, then spoke quickly when Matt took a threatening step. Of course I could see his face. And his cloak is green, or maybe gray. It changes. It seems to fade into wherever he's standing. Sometimes you don't see him, even when you look right at him. Not unless he moves. And hers is blue, like the sky. And ten times fancier than any feast day clothes I ever saw. She's ten times prettier than anybody I ever saw, too. She's a high-born lady. Like in the stories, she must be. Her? Rand said. Who are you talking about? Matt put both hands on the top of his head and squeezed his eyes shut. They're the ones I meant to tell you about, Matt muttered, before you got me off onto... He cut off, opening his eyes for a sharp glance at Ewan. They arrived last evening, Matt went on after a moment, and took rooms here at the inn. I saw them right in. Their horses ran. I never saw horses so tall or so sleek. They look like they could run forever. I think he works for her. In service, Ewan broke in. They call it being in service in the stories. Matt continued as if Ewan had not spoken. Anyway, he defers to her, does what she says. Only, he isn't like a hired man. A soldier, maybe. The way he wears his sword, it's part of him, like his hand or his foot. He makes the merchant's guards look like cur dogs. And her, Rand? I never even imagined anyone like her. She's out of a Gleeman story. She's like... Like, he paused to give Ewan a sour look. Like a high-born lady, he finished with a sigh. But who are they? Ran asked. Except for merchants, once a year to buy tobacco and wool, and the peddlers, outsiders never came into the two rivers, or as good as never. Maybe a tar and ferry, but not this far south. Most of the merchants and peddlers have been coming for years, too. So they did not really count as strangers, 
Just outsiders. It was a good five years since the last time a real stranger appeared in Emmons Field, and he had been trying to hide from some sort of trouble up in Bearlawn that nobody in the village understood. He had not stayed long. What do they want? What do they want? Matt exclaimed. I don't care what they want. Strangers, Rand. And strangers like you never even dreamed of. Think of it. Rand opened his mouth, then closed it without speaking. The black-cloaked rider had him as nervous as a cat in a dog run. It just seemed like an awful coincidence, three strangers around the village at the same time. Three, if this fellow's cloak that changed colors never changed to black. Her name is Moraine, Ellen said in the momentary silence. I heard him say it. Moraine, he called her. The Lady Moraine. His name is Lan. The Wisdom may not like her, but I do. What makes you think Nynaeve dislikes her? Rand said. She asked the Wisdom for directions this morning, Ellen said, and called her child. Rand and Matt both whistled softly through their teeth, and Ellen tripped over his tongue in his haste to explain. The Lady Moraine didn't know she was the Wisdom. She apologized when she found out. She did. And asked some questions about herbs and about who is who around Evans Field just as respectfully as any woman in the village, more so than some. She's always asking questions about how old people are and how long they've lived where they live, and, oh, I don't know what all. Anyway, Nynaeve answered like she'd bitten a green sweet berry. Then, when the Lady Moraine walked away, Nynaeve stared after her like, like, well, it wasn't friendly, I can tell you that. Is that all? Rand said. You know Nynaeve's temper. When Senbui called her a child last year, she thumped him on the head with her stick. And he's in the village council, and old enough to be her grandfather besides. She flares up at anything, and never stays angry past turning around. That's too long for me, Ellen muttered. I don't care who Nynaeve thumps, Matt chortled, so long as it isn't me. This is going to be the best Beltine ever. A gleeman, a lady, who could ask for more? Who needs fireworks? A gleeman? Ewan said, his voice rising sharply. Come on, Rand, Matt went on, ignoring the younger boy. We're done here. You have to see this fellow. He bounded up the stairs with Ellen scrambling behind him, calling, Is there really a gleeman, Matt? This isn't like the ghost towns, is it? Or the frogs? Rand paused long enough to turn down the lamp, then hurried after them. In the common room, Rowan Hearn and Samuel Craw had joined the others in the front of the fire, so that the entire village council was there. Bran Alvir spoke now, his normally bluff voice pitched so low that only a rumbling murmur traveled beyond the close-gathered chairs. The mayor emphasized his words by tapping a thick forefinger into the palm of his other hand, and eyed each man in turn. They all nodded in agreement with whatever he was saying, though Sen more reluctantly than the rest. The way the men all but huddled together spoke more plainly than a painted sign. Whatever they were talking about, it was for the village council alone, at least for now. They would not appreciate Rand trying to listen in. Reluctantly, he pulled himself away. There was still the gleeman. And these strangers. Outside, Bella and the cart were gone, taken away by Hugh or Tad, the inn's stableman. Matt and Ellen stood glaring at one another a few paces from the front door of the inn, their cloaks whipping in the wind. For the last time, Matt barked, I am not playing a trick on you. There is a gleeman. Now go away. Rand, will you tell this woolhead I am telling the truth so he'll leave me alone? Pulling his cloak together, Rand stepped forward to support Matt, but words died as the hairs stirred on the back of his neck. He was being watched again. It was far from the feeling the hooded rider had given him, but neither was it pleasant, especially so soon after that encounter. A quick look about the green showed him only what he had seen before. Children playing, people preparing for festival, and no one more than glancing in his direction. The spring pole stood alone now, waiting. Bustle and childish shouts filled the side streets. All was as it should be, except that he was being watched. Then something led him to turn around to raise his eyes. On the edge of the inn's tile roof perched a large raven, swaying a little in the gusting wind from the mountains. Its head was cocked to one side, and one beady black eye was focused...
On him, he thought. He swallowed and suddenly anger flickered in him, hot and sharp. Filthy carrion eater, he muttered. I am tired of being stared at, Matt growled. And Rand realized his friend had stepped up beside him and was frowning at the raven too. They exchanged a glance, then as one their hands darted for rocks. The two stones flew true, and the raven stepped aside. The stones whistled through the space where it had been. Fluffing its wings once, it cocked its head again, fixing them with a dead black eye, unafraid, giving no sign that anything had happened. Rand stared at the bird in consternation. Did you ever see a raven do that? He asked quietly. Matt shook his head without looking away from the raven. Never. Nor any other bird either. A vile bird came a woman's voice from behind them, melodious despite echoes of distaste. To be mistrusted in the best of times. With a shrill cry, the raven launched itself into the air so violently that two black feathers drifted down from the roof's edge. Startled, Rand and Matt twisted to follow the bird's swift flight over the green and toward the cloud-tipped mountains of mist, tall beyond the westwood, until it dwindled to a speck in the west, then vanished from view. Rand's gaze fell to the woman who had spoken. She, too, had been watching the flight of the raven, but now she turned back and her eyes met his. He could only stare. This had to be the Lady Moraine, and she was everything that Matt and Ewan had said. Everything and more. When he had heard she called Nynaeve a child, he had pictured her as old, but she was not. At least, he could not put any age to her at all. At first, he thought she was as young as Nynaeve, the longer he looked, the more he thought she was older than that. There was a maturity about her large, dark eyes, a hint of knowing that no one could have gotten young. For an instant, he thought those eyes were deep pools about to swallow him up. It was plain why Matt and Ewan named her a lady from a Gleeman's tale, too. She held herself with a grace and air of command that made him feel awkward and stumble-footed. She was barely tall enough to come up to his chest, but her presence was such that her height seemed the proper one, and he felt ungainly in his tallness. Altogether, she was like no one he had ever seen before. The wide hood of her cloak framed her face and dark hair, hanging in soft ringlets. He had never seen a grown woman with her hair unbraided. Every girl in the two rivers waited eagerly for the woman's circle of her village to say she was old enough to wear a braid. Her clothes were just as strange. Her cloak was sky-blue velvet, with thick silver embroidery, leaves and vines and flowers all along the edges. Her dress gleamed faintly as she moved, a darker blue than the cloak, and slashed with cream. A necklace of heavy gold links hung around her neck, while another gold chain, delicate and fastened in her hair, supported a small, sparkling blue stone in the middle of her forehead. A wide belt of woven gold encircled her waist, on the second finger of her left hand was a gold ring in the shape of a serpent biting its own tail. He had certainly never seen a ring like that, though he recognized the great serpent, an even older symbol for eternity than the Wheel of Time. Fancier than any feast day clothes, Ewan had said, and he was right. No one ever dressed like that in the True Rivers. Not ever. Good morning, Mistress, uh, Lady Moraine. Rand said. His face grew hot at his tongue's fumbling. Good morning, Lady Moraine, Matt echoed somewhat more smoothly, but only a little. She smiled, and Rand found himself wondering if there was anything he might do for her, something that would give him an excuse to stay near her. He knew she was smiling at all of them, but it seemed meant for him alone. It really was just like seeing a Gleeman's tale come to life. Matt had a foolish grin on his face. You know my name, she said, sounding delighted. As if her presence, however brief, would not be the talk of the village for a year. But you must call me Moraine, not Lady. And what are your names? Ewan leaped forward before either of the others could speak. My name is Ewan Fingar, my lady. I told them your name, that's how they know. I heard Lan say it, but I wasn't eavesdropping. No one like you has ever come to Emmonsfield before. There's a gleeman in the village for Beltine, too. And tonight is winter night. Will you come to my house? My mother has apple cakes. 
I shall have to see, she replied, putting a hand on Ellen's shoulder. Her eyes twinkled with amusement, though she gave no other sign of it. I do not know how well I could compete against a gleeman, Ellen, but you must call me Moraine. She looked expectantly at Rand and Matt. I'm Matt from Cawthon, the, uh, Moraine, Matt said. He made a stiff, jerking bow, then went red in the face as he straightened. Rand had been wondering if he should do something of the sort, the way men did in stories, but with Matt's example, he merely spoke his name. At least he did not stumble over his own tongue this time. Moraine looked from him to Matt and back again. Rand thought her smile, a bare curve of the corners of her mouth, was now the sort Egwene wore when she had a secret. I may have some small tasks to be done from time to time while I am in Emmonsfield, she said. Perhaps you would be willing to assist me? She laughed as their ascents tumbled over one another. Here, she said, and Rand was surprised when she pressed a coin into his palm, closing his hand tightly around it with both of hers. There's no need, he began, but she waved aside his protest as she gave Ewan a coin as well, then pressed Matt's hand around one the same way she had Rand's. Of course there is, she said. You cannot be expected to work for nothing. Consider this a token, and keep it with you. So you will remember that you have agreed to come to me when I ask it. There is a bond between us now. I'll never forget, Ewan piped up. Later we must talk, she said, and you must tell me all about yourselves. Lady, I mean, Moraine, Rand asked hesitantly as she turned away. She stopped and looked back over her shoulder, and he had to swallow before going on. Why have you come to Emmonsfield? Her expression was unchanged, but suddenly he wished he had not asked, though he could not have said why. He rushed to explain himself anyway. I don't mean to be rude. I'm sorry. It's just that no one comes into the two rivers except the merchants and peddlers when the snow isn't too deep to get down from Bearlon. Almost no one. Certainly no one like you. The merchants' guards sometimes say this is the back end of forever. And I suppose it must seem that way to anyone from outside. I just wondered. Her smile did fade then, slowly, as if something had been recalled to her. For a moment, she merely looked at him. I am a student of history, she said at last. A collector of old stories. This place you call the Two Rivers has always interested me. Sometimes I study the stories of what happened here long ago. Here, and at other places. Stories? Rand said. Whatever happened in the two rivers to interest someone like... I mean, what could have happened here? And what else would you call it beside the two rivers? Matt added. That's what it has always been called. As the wheel of time turns, Moraine said, half to herself and with a distant look in her eyes, places wear many names. Men wear many names. Many faces. Different faces, but always the same man. Yet no one knows the great pattern the wheel weaves, or even the pattern of an age. We can only watch and study and hope. Rand stared at her, unable to say a word, even to ask what she meant. He was not sure she had meant for them to hear. The other two were just as tongue-tied, he noticed. Ewan's mouth hung open. Moraine focused on them again, and all three gave a little shake as if waking up. Later we will talk, she said. None of them said a word. Later. She moved on toward the wagon bridge, appearing to glide over the ground rather than walk, her cloak spreading on either side of her like wings. As she left, a tall man Rand had not noticed before moved away from the front of the inn and followed her, one hand resting on the long hilt of a sword. His clothes were a dark grayish green that would have faded into leaf or shadow, and his cloak swirled through shades of gray and green and brown as it shifted in the wind. It almost seemed to disappear at times, that cloak, fading into whatever lay beyond it. His hair was long and gray at the temples, held back from his face by a narrow leather headband. That face was made from stony planes and angles, weathered but unlined despite the gray in his hair. When he moved, 
Rand could think of nothing but a wolf. In passing the three youths, his gaze ran over them, eyes as cold and blue as a midwinter dawn. It was as if he were weighing them in his mind, and there was no sign on his face of what the scales told him. He quickened his pace until he caught up to Moraine, then slowed to a walk by her shoulder, bending to speak to her. Rand let out a breath he had not realized he had been holding. That was Lon, Edwin said throatily, as if he too had been holding his breath. It had been that kind of look. I'll bet he's a warder. Don't be a fool, Matt laughed, but it was a shaky laugh. Warders are just in stories. Anyway, warders have swords and armor covered in gold and jewels, and spend all their time up north in the Great Blight, fighting evil and Trollocs and such. He could be a warder, Edwin insisted. Did you see any jewels or gold on him? Matt scoffed. Do we have Trollocs in the two rivers? We have sheep. I wonder what could ever have happened here to interest someone like her. Something could have, Rand answered slowly. They say the inn's been here for a thousand years, maybe more. A thousand years of sheep, Matt said. A silver penny, Ellen burst out. She gave me a whole silver penny. Think what I can buy when the peddler comes. Rand opened his hand to look at the coin she had given him and almost dropped it in surprise. He did not recognize the fat silver coin with the raised image of a woman balancing a single flame on her upturned hand. But he had watched while Bran Alvere weighed out the coins merchants brought from a dozen lands, and he had an idea of its value. That much silver would buy a good horse anywhere in the two rivers, with some left over. He looked at Matt and saw the same stunned expression he knew must be on his own face. Tilting his hand so Matt could see the coin, but not Ellen, he raised a questioning eyebrow. Matt nodded, and for a minute they stared at one another in perplexed wonder. What kind of chores does she have? Rand asked finally. I don't know, Matt said firmly, and I don't care. I won't spend it either, even when the peddler comes. With that, he thrust his coin into his coat pocket. Nodding, Rand slowly did the same with his. He was not sure why, but somehow what Matt said seemed right. The coin should not be spent. Not when it came from her. He could not think of anything else Silver was good for, but... Do you think I should keep mine, too? Anguished indecision painted Ellen's face. Not unless you want to, Matt said. I think she gave it to you to spend, Rand said. Ellen looked at his coin, then shook his head and stuffed the silver penny into his pocket. I'll keep it, he said mournfully. There's still the gleeman, Rand said, and the younger boy brightened. If he ever wakes up, Matt added. Rand, Ellen asked, is there a gleeman? You'll see, Rand answered with a laugh. It was clear Ellen would not believe until he set eyes on the gleeman. He has to come down sooner or later. Shouting drifted across the wagon bridge, and when Rand looked to see what was causing it, his laughter became wholehearted. A milling crowd of villagers, from gray-haired oldsters to toddlers barely able to walk, escorted a tall wagon toward the bridge. A huge wagon drawn by eight horses. The outside of its rounded canvas cover hung about with bundles like bunches of grapes. The peddler had come at last. Strangers and a gleeman, fireworks and a peddler. It was going to be the best Beltine ever.